like to welcome all of you to Elaine Wood's Celebration of Life. We have family and friends from all over the world, many of whom have traveled great distances to be here. I'd like to extend a very large thank you to all of Elaine's friends who are joining us from both near and far. There's nothing Elaine liked more than all of her people gathering together. All of Elaine's relations are here today as well. Her little sister, Florence from Comox, there we go. <laughs> and <laughs> Florence's children, Jeff and Christy, and Christy's husband, Jim. Elaine's eldest son, Rob, from Norway. His wife, Anne, and their children, Oda and Henrik. Their respective partners, Martin and Shannon, and their children, Marie, Nora, James, and Lucy. Elaine's eldest daughter, Heather, from Victoria, husband, Dave, and their children, Corey and Kelly. Uh, partners Caitlin and Damien and their children Kelsey, Tommy, Parker, Emerson, and Kingston. Elaine's youngest son Blair from Regina, his wife Jackie and their children Kim and Darren, and Elaine's youngest daughter from Vancouver, her husband Karen from Vancouver, <laughs> her husband Daryl and their children Kate and Niall and Kate's husband Adam. I am one of those relations. For those of you I haven't met, or who has been a few years, my name is Kelly, and I am one of Elaine's grandchildren, fifth from the top, to be exact. I'm also Heather's youngest daughter. To me, Elaine has always been Anna. To open our program today, we'll begin with one of the things that Elaine was so fond of. I have vivid memories of sitting with her in a living room in Regina on Hillsdale, in her deep cove home, or in Olympic Village, listening to music together. I can picture her sitting there, getting to her favorite part, volume up and eyes closed, enjoying every moment. Some of my favorite songs to this day are those that Nana introduced me to. With that, I would like to ask Elaine's grandchildren's partners, Shannon and Adam, to join us to perform. One of Elaine's favorite things, you may hear me say that a lot today, was supporting her family and friends in their pursuits and celebrating them. Her pride and joy in listening to Shannon and Adam perform and wow was all with their talents was immense. Shannon and Adam will be performing Keep Me In Your Heart.
you so much, Adam and Jan, for the beautiful performance. Next, I would like to ask Heather, one of William's daughters, to come up to begin our group of speakers. How oh, somebody who's five feet two has a daughter who's just about six feet tall? I don't know, man. Anyway, we'll adjust for length. Mom <laughs> um, would be so overjoyed to see you all here. She would love to be a part of today's celebration. Obviously, she is in many ways, but not a, not a person. Rob, Blair, Karen, and I, and our partners, mom's grandchildren and great grandchildren feel really privileged to be able to reconnect with you all and to celebrate mom. Many of you know, but I'm just going to do a little bit of mom's history, um, interspersed with maybe some of her stories, probably all of which you've heard, but anyway. Um, mom was born in 1937 in Regina. She lived with her parents and paternal grandparents until she started kindergarten at Kamat School. Her earliest memories, as she recounts them, were the gift of her teddy, um, on her first birthday, the little teddy that's up there. Um, her grandfather, pretending to sit on her, he affectionately called mom the little fella <laughs> when she occupied his reading chair and rushing out independently onto Lawrence Street at age four to stop a police car uh, that was running or chasing a bandit of some sort. I often wondered whether mom's ability to establish and nurture friendships regardless of age and generational differences was forged living in a three-generation family household as she was during her toddler years. <clears throat> Life got more interesting and more fun with the addition of a sister. Mom loved her little sister Florence, who's here today, um, who was born when mom was seven. She would take for, uh, Florence for walks in her stroller, already a short a storyteller at a young age, when mom was stopped by passers-by and asked what her cute little sister's name was. Mom said she would look up at the nearest uh, street sign and say, uh, Victoria, <laughs> or some such thing. In the early days, they had a tiny playhouse attached to their Victoria Avenue bungalow. Mom established connections and relationships with the shopkeepers delivering food to her mother in the front of house, as was the custom in the day. They would come to the backyard metal gate to offer mom for five cents a freshly baked bun or a small fruits and vegetables. Mom's keen interest to detail her excellent memory and delight of small events meant that when she recounted these exchanges, you felt like you were there. Their family of four traveled most summers. For years, they hol holidayed in a redesigned RCAF ambulance turned trailer. If we think about the whole Princeton Highway that it has some scary parts now, just imagine pulling a trailer over those narrow gravel roads. Mom had remarkable, uh, exceptional, might I say, recall of many of their trips, spinning adventures and, many, and misadventures into vivid tapestries and stories. Years later, she and Dad would trailer the four of us and Piggy, the bulldog, around, around Canada for weeks in the summer with more adventures and misadventures. I'm sure, you, I'm sure many of you might comment today on Mom's amazing memory and capture of the smallest details. In response to a question I posed her a while back about uh, her first job, she wrote me, she said, Working at Simpson Department Store was almost everybody's first job. We earned seven dollars a Saturday. Two Saturdays would pay for a short sleeve sweater. Three Saturdays pay would be enough for a skirt or a plaid, some plaid pants, which were very in, or a cardigan sweater called a kitten. When working in the depart uh, in the shoe department, she said we used to play catch with the shoe boxes in, in the back, not in the sales area. Working in the men's ties before Christmas was the very least fun, and infants and children wear was her most favorite. Mom and Dad met in the late 1950s when Dad, Morty, who some of you know, uh, was an art student at Municipal Hale in Regina, and Mom worked in the snow pool for the summer. To hear her tell, her friend and co-worker took a look at Dad, sized him up as he walked through the office doors for the first time that summer, Dad was very good looking, and that day he was wearing a hat. Uh, her friend announced to mom, I never go out with a guy who wears a hat like that. So 
With the competition out of the way, Mum and Dad dated and fell in love. They were married on a typical Saskatchewan winter day in December 1957. The temperature was minus 27. And so they decided to honeymoon and take a train to Winnipeg for a quick and chilly honeymoon. Mom returned to her work as a kindergarten teacher and dad hustled back for uh, fiscal year end, which was quite a busy time for an accountant, which is what he did. They lived in a basement apartment not far from here and then an apartment block where mom met Barb and Dick Lane, who are both here today, which is so exciting. Um, Roth came home to that apartment in 1959 and I did as well in 1960. Apparently cold weather taught good character or something because mom told us stories of putting us babies out on the balcony to sleep well bundled in the middle of winter regardless of how cold it was. I remember, remember mom describing our early childhood as a series of phases, you know, like the terrible twos, the terrific threes, and so on. I recall that framing was trotted out particularly when mom was exasperated with one of us or all of us, as in, I can't wait for this phase to be over. Now, in fairness, when Rob and I were roughly in the terrible two phase, we almost burned the house down while playing with matches. Us kids starting the, the field on fire across the street from our house didn't happen until many phases later. When I think of mom and apply her framing to her life, in a simplified way, I see mom's life in four phases. Early marriage and early parenting, Larange, liberated, liberation, and loss. Becoming a West Coaster, and COVID and connected. Family life was full on with the purchase of 4024 Hillsdale Street, that many of you might remember. Um, in 1961, the addition of Blair in 1962, and Karen Ann, the Bulldog Piggy, in 1965. Mom's days were busy with kids' needs, chauffeuring, bridge club, community volunteering, and endless yard work trying to introduce nutrients into the rich prairie, or the dense prairie jungle. While we tri kids traveled in packs and clumps, mom and dad found ways to make each of us feel special. They also challenged us to light a candle in our own communities. This took a, the form of, for example, fundraising for the scouts by selling chocolate bars, a very bad idea with four kids in a house and an insatiable appetite for the as yet unsold chocolate. <laughs> and participating in a walkathon to raise money for the uh, then not, not yet built YWCA. As was the custom in the day, or at least on our suburban lock, we were provided with lots of independence. Mom tells a story of Blair disappearing on a regular basis, around age eight or so, under the guise of helping a guy, uh, a neighbor presumably, build a house. Curious to find out who Bear, Blair's building buddy was, Mom eventually followed Blair down the street where she discovered his friend was a Baptist minister and the, the house under construction was a Baptist community hall. Mom cheered and supported us uh, when we took stands at school, like when in grade one, Karen refused to participate in a teacher's activity in which she rewarded the students for clean fingernails with gold stars. Mom saw that many of the students, or Karen saw that many of the students around her felt quite ashamed of their dirty hands, in part because many of them didn't have running water in their homes, and she boycotted the game with mom's full backing. <laughs> I think the 1960s were both joyful and challenging for mom. She gave birth to four kids in six years. She was the one primarily overseeing families going on. Families going on. She did all of the cooking and most of the cleaning. She planned our social calendars and plotted our, our summer getaways. She was an avid gardener, she got involved in local politics. There was lots of joy and laughter and connectedness through those years. Mom made sure that we participated in local festivities and community buildings. One of her favorite uh, self-deprecating stories, probably many of you have heard it, involved an ill-planned community pet show and parade in a local park one summer in around 1967 or 1968. We had Piggy, the English Bulldog, decked out in the Union Jack. We had a rabbit in a decorated basket and a gerbil somehow sewn into Blair's shirt pocket. All of the pets bought prizes, which took the form of chocolates. It was a scorching hot day. The animals fought. They chewed through, leapt out of, or ripped through their enclosures. 
Piggy ended up with a bloody nose from an encounter with a cat. We kids were sunburned, sticky, probably miserable. Mom sent us her mother, who's a bit prim and proper, lovely woman, but also, uh, who accompanied us on, on this particular outing, leaned in during the mayhem as the situation was devolving, kindly pointed out or suggested, did you remember to bring your wet washcloth? <laughs> uh, the answer was no, but anyway. <laughs> in the 1960s, Mom read The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. She told me it was an eye-opener for her. I'd say this marked Mom's next phase. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with this book, Betty Friedan, in a little nutshell, challenged the assumptions that women should have sufficient life fulfillment through their domestic tasks and responsibilities. Friedan audaciously suggested that women should consider and develop a new life plan that included a career, a feminist perspective, and a reevaluation of the feminine mystique. While her writings have been criticized as classist and racist, they did galvanize many women in the day to think about their roles and their identity in society. For me as her nine-year-old daughter, daughter, hearing mom talk about this revelatory book opened my understanding of who my mom was. To be sure, she was the glue that stuck us together. She was the coordinator and facilitator, the person who ensured our needs were met. I knew she, I knew she could and did stand up for what she believed in. She held her own opinions and could vigorously and competently argue her position. I knew she was a keen reader and she was smart and quick-witted. I knew she was a, lo a, a loyal friend. But what I saw evolving and got to understand more completely was her intense curiosity, her questioning of why things are as they are, her desire to see more, do more, and be more. We kids experienced the practicalities of shedding domestic responsibilities when we were all expected to make a meal for the family on our cooking day. This awakening of sorts coincided with Dad's desire to find a job in which he wasn't always saying no. Um, he worked with the Provincial Department of Finance at that time. They were ready for a change. The invitation to move to Laurent and be part of the new Department of Northern Saskatchewan came at just the right time. They both leapt at the opportunity to leave Regina to live in Orange and be part of the experiment that was DNS. We four, four kids were keen for an adventure. Did you pull up? Not so sure. She was enthusiastic about where the witches were even colder, but she came along too. Many of you here today are lifelong friends from the Orange days. Those were two very packed, very eventful, very impactful years from 1972 to 1974. Mom thrived being around liberated, young, clever, passionate, left-wingers, and idealists. Mom became a citizen activist. She created the Lorange Work Co-op uh, with uh, some of you who are here today. She worked to establish a newspaper and lobbied to democratize the closed-door town council meetings. She taught Cree-speaking children. She worked on the Churchill River study. She even took on the RCMP for the improper placement of a Laurent stop sign and won. <laughs> Mom always had a lot of music, as you've already heard. She was a talented pianist. I remember she and Dad discovered and celebrated new music in the Laurent years. The music of Joan Baez, Judy Collins, Joni Mitchell, Simon Garfunkel, Buffy St. Marie, Chief Dan George, Pete Seeger, and countless others. Their taste in music was eclectic, but she and Dad would play Hey Jude and Lady in Red at high volume, perhaps by way of celebrating the Lorange interlude in their lives. And we're playing some of Mom's songs before and after this today. I'll stop talking eventually. While our time in the Orange was short, it changed everything in our lives. New connections had been made, new and enduring friendships were forged and nourished. Mom turned her attention to work outside of the home. She worked in many capacities over the next many years, always with a political and social development component. She became quite involved with the Waffle and then the NDP. She researched Isle Across History, never quite finished that one, but she did an amazing amount of work on it, <laughs> and worked with the Pine House community uh, on the child care center. She advocated and connected and grew and flourished. She loved her work with Doug MacArthur and Simon Dion and Louise Samard and John Nielsen, working variously as executive constituency assistant. And then she retired in 1999. As is the human 
human condition, we all and sometimes sometimes lose people we love. Mom's greatest loss was dad. Crazy, 40 years. Oh, anyway. Mom's greatest loss was dad dying when he was just 49 years old, which was in 1984, almost 40 years ago. They were soulmates, so well suited in temperament, wit, and humor. His early death shook up to her core. It was a hard slog through grief. Mom leaned heavily on many of you um, in, 19, in 1984 and beyond. She also tackled widowhood with her usual curiosity. She read everything she could get her hands on about her new identity that she hadn't asked for. She even did presentations um, on her own experience and on what she had learned. I don't think you have to personally go through grief and loss to show compassion. I do think, though, that Mom applied her experience and her wisdom to support many of us through our losses and hard times. She didn't hide, Mom didn't shy away from hard things. And so on to the next phase. Mom was diagnosed with COPD when she was my age. Mom slowly made plans to move to a climate that was more hospitable to her new diagnosis. Before she moved from Regina to Vancouver, she enrolled in research studies that helped examine exercise and the progression of COPD and in the hopes of helping others and herself as well in coping with the disease. Rather than feeling sorry for herself for accepting life with oxygen support meant a diminished life, when she moved to Vancouver in 2005, she embraced what she described as the West Coast lifestyle. Gone were the days where taking the dog for a walk meant a quick trip through Dairy Queen for a burger for the dog, Jesse, the bulldog, and a drive through West Anaport Park with the window down for fresh air. Mom quickly engaged a personal trainer and became more fit than she had ever been in her life. The grandkids will remember how their man would challenge them to hold a plank longer than she could hold a plank. <laughs> she was a plank champion. <laughs> Mom deeply valued her prairie roots, and she discovered so much about her adopted province and about Vancouver, and she thrived. She made new friends while always keeping in touch with old friends. She became a Canucks super fan. She had a special place in her heart for Henrik and Daniel City. They kind of feel like the extra you know, siblings, but anyway. She willingly drove friends to doctor's appointments, she explored new restaurants, and went to all corners of the city, often just out of the desire to know what a certain part of the city was all about. Mom was approachable and curious, so she would have interactions with, well, iguanas being draped over her neck in Gastown, for example. She zipped around in her red electric scooter. Every day was a new adventure. Mom was endlessly grateful to Karen and Daryl and their kids for literally opening doors for her and welcoming her to her new West Coast home. Uh, they would become her home care support um, through her, those years to 2023. She was able to stay home until she died. And we are so grateful for everything they did for mom. As you might know, mom's big on family. Mom celebrated each addition to our family and mourned our losses as well. She welcomed new partners and immersed herself in our areas of interest. Teaching, finance, midwifery, political journalism, all things cars, IT, architecture, health policy, human resources. <laughs> her lifelong learning and her keenness uh, to have meaningful and deeper connections meant she continued to learn about all our areas of interest and those of our grand, her grandchildren, including the food services industry, fertility treatment, building engineering and project management, athletics, accounting, business consulting, nursing, insurance, theater, the Raptors, and much more. Yeah. Mom's last phase was punctuated by COVID. Mom went outside only a few times after the start of the pandemic, being acutely aware that COVID would have dire consequences for her. Many of you would not have seen mom in the past four or five years, but this physical isolation meant that mom just had to do things like master Zoom and FaceTime and double down on her letter writing and emails. She was a master texter. She knew more about my kids than I knew about them. You will hear how much mom meant to her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. She kept abreast of their activities, their interests, their troubles, their successes. She knew how much we meant, we knew how much we meant to her and she felt the love in return. I'm so pleased that we've come together to celebrate Mom and to unleash a lifetime of memories. She didn't exactly think of herself as the matriarch, though she was, as wise, though she was, 
that's unique. Who she was. I feel blessed to have been guided by her and to have such a strong, passionate, and compassionate role model for my years. Thank you very much, Heather. Next, Florence, thank you. Yes. Come forward, please. to read a poem that Heather uh, gave to me uh, and very fitting. It is titled Ithaca. When you start on your journey to Ithaca, then pray that the road is long, full of adventure, full of knowledge. Do not fear the Lestrigonians and the Cyclopes and the angry Poseidon. You will never meet such as these on your path if your thoughts remain lofty, if a fine emotion touches your body and your spirit. You will never meet the less Gregorians and the Cyclopes and the fierce Poseidon if you do not carry them within your soul, if your soul does not raise them up before you. Then pray that the road is long, that the summer mornings are many, that you will enter ports seen for the first time with such pleasure, with such joy. Stop at Phoenician markets and purchase fine merchandise, mother of pearl and corals, amber and ebony, and pleasurable perfumes of all kinds. Buy as many pleasurable perfumes as you can. Visit hosts of Egyptian cities to learn and learn from those who have knowledge. Always keep Ithaca fixed in your mind. To arrive there is your ultimate goal. But do not hurry the voyage at all. It is better to let it last for long years, and even to anchor at the isle when you are old, rich with all that you have gained on the way, not expecting that Ithaca will offer you riches. Ithaca has given you the beautiful voyage. Without her, you would never have taken the road. But she has nothing more to give you. And if you find her poor, Ithaca has not defrauded you. With the great wisdom you have gained, with so much experience, you must surely have understood by then what Ithaca means. Together for stealing all my points. <laughs> this is going to be very short. Uh, now I'm not going to go into the long history of her mom and sort of what she's done. I'm going to talk to a bit about sort of how she was to me as a person, sort of the traits that I sort of value most about her. I think one trait that everyone will recognize is that she had a love of people. She would talk with anyone uh, at any time. Uh, she was extremely good at keeping. Uh, close to friends and family. She, she was always uh, getting visitors, uh, managing to keep in touch with, with old friends. Uh, that was one of the things that, that really got me. The, the kids and the grandkids just had a wonderful relationship, and we'll hear more about that. And uh, as Heather said, um, you can never beat her with news, because she always got a text message or talked to one of the kids. So you're sort of last one to know the news. She, she knew it before anyone. Uh, she was very IT savvy, so she was on uh, sort of the Snapchat and Instagram, you name it. Uh, one of the bad memories I had is when she sort of got on the computer for, for a while. That'd be a little family intervention. She got totally hooked on Angry Birds. <laughs> that. Do you, do you remember that face? So, uh, from here four in the morning, you'd be getting emails from her just before she went to bed. Uh, so she, she, she has a tendency to go overboard, as, uh, as most of us know. Uh, one of the things that really was a joy in her life was she she got one of those uh, digital photo frames, uh, Aura, and uh, so she had photos all the time just going of her kids and grandkids and, and things like that. We could uh, uh, send pictures back and forth so we could uh, sort of fill up 
And every discussion as we discussed earlier today was how many photos do you have? She was so proud that she had 3,500 or something like that. And uh, she could never beat her on that. Uh, she really kept in touch with a lot of old friends. Uh, Lenore Nielsen, who isn't here unfortunately, was a childhood friend of mom's. And uh, every birthday they still kept in touch. And uh, I know they were going on for 75, 80 years of friendship. Also a very close friend with the Lanes from very, very early on. Lived in the same apartment block way back when. And we were, well, we were three, four, we were just small little ones. And Bob and I have been friends back then. He moved down east and uh, the family has sort of had a parallel life but we've always been in mesh. I'm uh, so happy to see the sort of the Lane family out in, in full force here. Yeah, really appreciate that. Uh, she knew everyone, as I said. Uh, one time, after she just briefly after she moved to Deep Cove, uh, she sent me out on one of these Starbucks rounds, as uh, she was wont to do. Uh, she has a bit of a special order. So when I got there, the uh, the barista uh, said, "Oh, uh, you you must be a lane son." <laughs> uh, so recognizing the order and all that, and uh, obviously she'd been there quite a number of times. <laughs> So you get back home and sort of, that, that was strange with this verse. And oh, oh yeah, that was so and so. And she could tell me life story this verse. So she, uh, she really knew her and got to talk to her neighbors and all that. Uh, I don't think she was too happy with me when I moved to Norway 43 years ago, 42, 43 years ago. I think she sort of always thought I'd stay here. Uh, and she supported me on that in, in all the time. In fact, one of the last things she did before I moved to Norway, of course, gave me a room that uh, I could uh, give to my, my wife. Uh, we talked all the time on the phone, uh, every Sunday, uh, usually for an hour. We talked during the week, uh, sort of usually once a week. Uh, during the first years, there was no sort of telephones, it was about for a week's pay for a, for a <laughs> minute's uh, call. Uh, so there were letters, and I have boxes of letters uh, from my side just recently got the boxes of letters that I had sent her. So that's something that I really cherish and go through with uh, from time to time. She visited us in Norway a couple times. Uh, the last time with her sister Florence. There were great times uh, getting her getting to know our life. And uh, she felt it so important to sort of be able to say I've been there and to sort of experience that. Traveling for her was one of her big passions. Uh, as Heather explained, they traveled as a, as a family when we were kids. Uh, we traveled as a family when we were kids. And that was the one thing that she really, really loved. Uh, I think part of the biggest regret in her life was uh, dad dying so young. And uh, her getting so sick, so her travel plans, that was sort of her, her big dream. So we're tired of traveling around the world and seeing everything. What she really had was passion, and uh, there was no, never sort of halfway. Uh, she was all in every time, uh, whether it was teaching kids in, in kindergarten, up on the ranch, uh, with her constituents, uh, working with uh, John Nielsen. Uh, she was always up to date on the news, what was happening in Norway. Um, tennis was a big passion. Roger Federer, she knew whenever he was playing. And, uh, so that was her second love after that, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, so her, her third and fourth love, love uh, were probably Henrik and, and then the other Sadine. Uh, we have a lot of Sadine stories. Uh, Henrik, uh, the, I'm not sure whether it was a fortune or misfortune, uh, being there one time when Mom had seen the, the Sadine's, Henrik Sadine's house in McLean's. She thought she recognized it. I think they drove over half of the, sort of the great event over the area trying to find this house. Uh, she did a similar thing with Oda, uh, no. looking around Deep Cove for, for uh, Ben Affleck and John uh, Cable. Uh, Where did find that house? And that was in People magazine. Uh, there was always a, you know, I was a little skeptical with her hockey because she went a bit too, too overboard. Uh, the first time she did it was uh, one time, this was back in 2008, when uh, Mott was playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, he decided to move on from the Leafs, and there was wild speculation about where he was going to go. And I had the gross misfortune of mentioning to him that Henrik's coach 
and thought that he was going to go to Vancouver. Henrik's coach uh, took over after Borja Salmi in Sweden on the, on the team uh, that he played for, it was well connected in Sweden. Didn't think much of it until the next day I started getting calls about every 20 minutes uh, from this strange number that I did, didn't recognize. Uh, didn't uh, dare answer it, so I did a reverse yeah. search. And of course it had to be the Vancouver son who was contacted by mom. And uh, with the breaking news that, that in fact Watson Lee was coming to prom. So uh, this, is, this is so typical mom. Uh, she, uh, uh, so that, uh, I was a little more skeptical about uh, giving any breaking news to her. <laughs> there was another time when she, she called, and uh, this was back in 2011. It was when uh, Vancouver was playing Chicago in the, in the quarterfinals here. She was downtown, and uh, she was saying, you know, there are these well-dressed guys going across the street, and I recognized them. And I honked at them, and then I put my finger down like this to them. And of course it was, it was the Chicago Blackhawks walking across the street <laughs> where it was sort of Patrick Kane and uh, Mommy, you didn't do this. I thought like, this is about as bad as I could get. Uh, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the next day she called me and said that in fact the Chicago Sun Times had a big article about uh, where Patrick Kane had complained about the, these uh, sort of unpolite Vancouver families. <laughs> Specifically referencing uh, an old lady uh, on oxygen in a car. <laughs> this sort of got picked up by the, the Logan Mail, um, as it wanted to be. And, uh, so I, finally, I think uh, Karen got uh, she had uh, sort of friends who were in family with uh, Joel Quinville, who was a coach. So she got mom a big frame photo uh, signed by Patrick King, where he, like they said, uh, use the right finger next time. <laughs> Uh, well, she, she was a character. Um, there's probably thousands of mom stories here. I'm sure that uh, all of you have uh, numerous ones. Uh, I heard many during our reunion. We were up in Waskasu, uh, a place we visited often. I'm sure we'll hear more after this. But uh, after the mom stories are as, as long as you can uh, listen to. She touched absolutely everyone she she came in contact with and uh, think about her every day. So we all miss it. Thank you very much, Rob. And for our final program speaker today, I'd like to ask Elaine's eldest grandson, Corey, to please come forward to say a few words. that most of you know me, but uh, for those of you who don't, I'm Corey Trainer. I'm Elaine's oldest grandchild, um, and obviously, as you can imagine, this made me her favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but the really cool thing about Nana was that we were really all her favorite. I know that's cliche because we all love our kids equally, but <clears throat> Kelsey, we can't you sleep in that same bed. <laughs> But Nana loved all of us, both collectively, but also very uniquely. Uh, she took a lot of joy in sharing the things that she, we liked, um, in really exploring and cultivating the individual relationships that we had. All of us here can certainly attest to having received you know, text messages from her, sharing videos, sharing pictures or articles that she found and she knew right away that we would love. She was truly the matriarch of this family, and the way that she cultivated relationships will be sorely missed and treasured always. When Anna moved to BC and us out to Ontario, um, our visits were cut down a fair amount, and they were only a couple times a year, maybe. So I thought that I would just share a couple memories from when I was young and when I was still living in Regina. As some of you know, Nana had a fantastic jump group. Now this thing was awesome. It had shelves made out of cinder blocks, it had a nook under the stairs with a desk for the kids to write secret letters, 
and it literally had so much junk you could make mazes and tunnels out of it. It was so big that it even had its own little junk room attached to it. <laughs> Although most of the time you couldn't get to that one. So one skill that I possess um, is that I can be very organized. I like to be efficient, and I don't know if this is in part due to or in spite of always trying to clean that junk room. <laughs> Nana, she used to pay me when I would go over there to try and organize that place. And I would spend hours down there just working away, trying to figure it out. I never got it organized, but it didn't really matter because it just meant that there was always next time. Now, I did notice as I was writing this that it did make me realize kind of how crafty Nana was. And that's not because she managed to create a core memory with me of cleaning up her junk but because she probably made a core memory for someone else paying them to trash the place so that I could never catch. <laughs> Nana was such a special and unique person, and she will be missed terribly. I'm not fully able to put the feelings to words, but I'm sure most of you feel the same as I do. She was a force if you found yourself on her bad side. She was resilient, as anyone I know, and inspirational right up until the end. And she was also the person that would have all of us grandkids over, and then after we left, furiously play jazz ball on the computer because no way was she gonna let us have the high score. <laughs> so if this life turns out to be a video game, Nana will be in pretty good shape because she'll have a pretty damn high score. I love you, Nana, and thanks for everything. As we wait for this to warm up, as we've heard today, Elaine lived a long, interesting, and full life. All of us here have known our different parts of her journey, so Kim and Jackie have put together a slideshow for us to enjoy as we travel through Elaine's life together. Try to remember the kind of September When life was slow and oh so mellow Try to remember the kind of September When grass was green and grain was yellow Try to remember the kind of September When you were a young and callow fellow Try to remember, and if you remember Then follow, follow Try to remember when life was so tender That no one wept except the willow Try to remember when life was so tender That dreams were kept beside your pillow Try to remember when life was so tender That love was an ember about to billow Try to remember, and if you remember Then follow, follow If I 
could save time in a bottle The first thing that I'd like to do Is to save every day Till eternity passes away Just to spend them with you If I could make days last forever If words could make wishes come true I'd save every day like a treasure And then again I would spend them with you But there never seems to be enough time To do the things you want to do once you find them I've looked around enough to know You're the one I want to go through time with If I had a box just for wishes And dreams that had never come true The box would be empty Except for the memory of how They were answered by you But there never seems to be enough time To do the things you want to do Once you find them I looked around enough to know You're the one I want to go
Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness gracious. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly feeling inspired. So I would now like to open up the floor. I don't think I turn the mic back on. Um, we'll be doing an open mic of sorts. So for anyone who has something that they would like to share, they'll have the opportunity to do so. Um, I would ask that you please use the microphone, even though I'm not right now, to make sure that everyone can hear you. Is there anyone who would like to take the floor first? Come on up. It's like Rob said, we've stolen my lines. <laughs> I just want to thank Heather actually for the gift to me of being able to share memories of the name through email in the last month of your life. We wrote, I wrote back and forth that Heather read, and then she would tell me Elaine's response, and it was wonderful actually. It was a gift. It's a gift we should remember to share with each other, to tell each other how much they mean to us and how much our friendship means to us before it's really in the last days of your life. I had the gift also and the very good fortune of being a friend of Elaine's for many years. After she moved to Vancouver, I saw her a lot at the beginning, and then as time went on, not so much, but we never lost touch. We often would text or email or something outrageous would happen, mostly politics, um, often U.S. politics, but not always, and some, there would be something hilarious that we'd have to share, and that would be a back and forth, and it was always like that. I, I learned so much from Elaine um, by way of history, genealogy, politics, certainly the essential value of family, and very much the importance of friendship. She was there for the happy times, for sure, and most certainly the sad times. Um, she was always inspiring, always with a smile, and often with a very hearty laugh that was all familiar. I loved her chicken pot pie, and I still make it. And she loved my bushy swan. When she first asked me to make my bushy swan, I didn't know what she was talking about, because I always call it potato and leek soup. <laughs> now I call it bushy swan. <laughs> That's more of a ring to it. We exchanged recipes, we exchanged books, we exchanged ideas, we talked a lot. And as with so many of you, I was encouraged by the CD Barcelona, which I still blast off in my living room whenever I feel the need. I learned that from Elaine that you can dramatically change your lifestyle, as she did. When she retooled her life by moving from a house packed with antiques, rooms full of documents, boxes and boxes and boxes of research, to a beautiful minimalist home, thanks to Karen and Daryl, in Vancouver of which she was so proud. She took me around the first time I went out there to show me all of the clean surfaces, and that she had nothing on anything, but she had lots of storage, and pulled out the Murphy bed to show me that I could actually sleep there, but at her desk, she was, she was totally amazing, actually. She was so thrilled with it. I learned from her tenacity in taking control of her health. And expanding her lung capacity by hiring a trainer and walking and walking because she loved her life in being such a dream environment with so many of her family close by and she wanted to thrive. Heather mentioned when Elaine, who never liked to walk here, said to me one day, Well, don't come over so early for dinner, I have to take Jessie for a walk. And I passed her in the park in her little red Toyota with Elaine hanging out one window and Jessie hanging out the other, driving around the park. <laughs> And that was Elaine taking us to the walk. <laughs> I learned about friendship from Elaine. She learned, she knew, and she listened. She really listened to you when you didn't know she was listening. And she often looked for something to share with you. I often found a book she knew I was looking for, or she thought I should read. Or she took, she, she took you somewhere that she thought you should know about. She once phoned to say that she found the ship my husband's father arrived on from Ireland. I didn't know I'd been looking. <laughs> but at some point in our discussion about some point in genealogy, she, I must have said something about searching it out, and Elaine took the initiative, so she got me going. She brought me to this venue for the first time, because there was an art gallery over in the corner that she thought I should see, and she had a friend who ran it. So we went over there and we often bought pottery over there. In Vancouver, she took me to Bee Gees. 
And she seemed to be on her first name basis with the other, as she was with so many other places. She demonstrated her belief in the value of citizenship and contribution by her example, of which you heard many examples. I often think that legacy, a legacy for anyone, is honesty. And for Elaine, she was honest she was about her life, about her point of view, about the love for her family. I rarely was with her when she didn't speak of at least one family member with pride and with happiness. We once had a hilarious discussion sitting around her dining room table where Janet she headed off to Norway for the first time to meet Rob's family, laughing about things she should avoid so that she wouldn't disgrace either herself or Rob, <laughs> like restraining from making outrageous comments, and as she said, not dropping the tie on her blouse in the rain. Her last words to me were, I love our unique, slightly off-kilter, and interesting history. And it ain't was unique. Can we miss her? Thank you so much. Anyone else have to come up next? Yeah, Christy, come on up. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Christy, I'm a lady's niece. Um, I recognize a lot of faces, many I haven't seen for a really long time. Um, well, here we go already. Let's see if I can keep this together. So, there's a lot of um, really great memories uh, and just listening to the stories. Um, for me, I, I was born in the mid 70s, and so I was kind of the benefactor of some of this emerging thinking um, and belief system that Elaine had. And so um, she was a role model for me. Um, she taught me to find humor in pretty much anything, some, sometimes the inappropriate things, uh, <laughs> the art of a story, um, and really living each day with curiosity. And I've, I've heard that theme uh, over and over um, today. And that was, that's something that I, I take with me and something I have a huge value. Um, and then just really cherishing and creating memories. And so I thought I would share a few. Um, some are funny, uh, some are really meaningful. Um, I think there's obviously some recipes that need to be exchanged in here. One of my few uh, memories was she taught me how to make uh, cold cucumber soup. And so she was so excited because it was very healthy. It was a very hot summer day. Um, and then promptly taught me that we need to cook croutons uh, in about three quarters of a pound of butter uh, to go with them. Uh, and I thought, this is, this is like my kind of recipe. Um, I also remember taking Jessie for walks, um, often consisting of going through the drive through um, getting her burgers, uh, sometimes an ice cream cone if she was very lucky, and uh, a lot of memories sitting around the Hillsdale dining room table, uh, one of which was at a certain time of the night uh, when Jesse was under the table. He had to be very, very still uh, and hope not to wake her uh, for fear of very loud barking um, and such. So um, another memory I have is uh, many of you uh, already know, obviously, Lane had a seal for life. Um, that seal went into her driving uh, as well. Um, she was a speed demon on the road and uh, I remember staying with her one summer and we were cleaning around the corner in her burgundy Jetta with uh, probably three gallons of paint um, in the trunk. Um, Heather probably remembers this one. Uh, we heard a thump and a bump and then Elaine's uh, contagious laugh and we went, uh-oh. Um, so pulled up at Heather's house. Uh, I think there's three gallons of white paint floating around uh, in, in Elaine's uh, trunk, and uh, only Elaine would laugh um, deeply at that. And I remember seeing her saying, "Oh, Christy, what are we gonna do?" Um, and I'm pretty sure Blair was called. So, um, <laughs> so there's a lot of really funny, great memories. Um, I think a lot uh, really kind of were based at this Hillsdale dining room table. So I remember watching her debate my father over politics. I think it was the first time I even understood the concept of politics. I was about six or seven. And uh, my dad and Elaine were on pretty opposite sides uh, of the spectrum uh, with politics. And I got to watch a very healthy debate um, on different views. And it kind of opened my eyes that day. 
um, in a way that I, I, I'm really grateful for. Um, she really taught me women's rights, civil rights, um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, it really made me think everybody feel like they belong. Excuse me. Um, and she really made me feel like I belonged um, and taught me the importance of having a voice. Um, she had a very strong voice for good um, and for advocacy, and that's stayed with me my entire life, um, and I'm grateful for it. <laughs> so it's smart, too. Uh, and so then I think as I grew up later in life, um, many of us talked about the fact that she always found something um, in someone to keep in touch with. Um, I moved to the States probably 15 years ago. Um, she really sparked my interest in politics, and even more so. Um, so the last seven years, she and I were in touch, at least weekly, exchanging all sorts of political ideas and articles. Um, we had a lot of our own conspiracy yeah, theories. Okay. Um, many of them were not true, um, but we really we believed in them strongly. Um, I thought, yes, this is what's going to happen. Um, and so in every single part of my life, I always think about what would my auntie Lane do, or what would she say? And uh, I feel incredibly grateful. Um, I often think of her laugh. Uh, especially in the most inappropriate moments, um, and it brings me kind of humor and heart, um, and I just feel incredibly grateful um, and thankful for having her in my life. Kim, if you want to come up and read a note from Lena's uh, childhood best friend, Laura. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Kim Wood, and Blair's oldest daughter, and um, one of Elaine's grandchildren. I am reading a piece written by Lenore, who could not be here with us today, though I know she would have loved to be. Lenore and Nana were best friends from kindergarten, and they maintained a friendship through more than 80 years. Lenore now lives in Ottawa. Elaine was truly my best friend. In thinking about her, I realized that we only lived in the same city until we were in our early 20s, but for the next 65 years, we never lost that special connection. Elaine had a remarkable memory. When I try to remember when we first met, I'm not sure, probably in kindergarten at Cannot School, but Elaine would remember. We were together all the time, and the minute I'd get home, I'd have to phone her, 6570, long before Lakeside 2, extension. Um, why do I remember that? And why do I have trouble remembering my license plate number? Mine was 8792. Most weekends, we would have sleepovers at either my place or the Ellerkins. I remember the back bedroom with the twin beds. Where Florence slept, I don't know. And I would remember. Many summers in the Elderton family many summers the Elderton family went on long holidays in with their trailer, like to the Maritimes or California or BC. She would write me long letters describing the things they saw. When she wasn't away, Elaine came with me to my grandparents' place in Nipawin Man Nipna. Thank you, Manitoba. <laughs> or I would go with them to Katekwa Beach. Or she would come with me to Regina Beach, where we rented a cottage for two weeks every summer. What a thrill when I was invited to go with them to Banff the summer after grade eight. We bought matching jackets for the trip. Mr. Elderkin had cut a hole behind the back seat of our car, their car, so our feet could extend through the trunk, and that was where we slept. <laughs> we both had our first jobs at Simpsons, but the summer after grade 12, we got jobs at Municipal Hale. Also working there was a young man who was doing some bookkeeping or something. He obviously caught Elaine's eye, and we spent few or coffee breaks together as she and Marley spent time getting to know each other. After a year at Regina College, I went on to Saskatoon and Elaine to Teachers College. Florence and I were bridesmaids for their Christmas time wedding, 
on, I'm sure, the coldest day of the year. I remember Elaine's bouquet freezing as we went from the church to the reception. A year and a half later, I was getting married. John had won the stamp of approval as he found a Scott Collegiate and was one of Mr. Elderkin's favorite students. John took all the shop courses in high school, and despite the fact that he had to catch up in some of the academic courses a year or so later in order to get into university, he always said it was the best education he had. He did later go on to get a PhD in electron physics. Of course, I was planning on having Elaine as my bridesmaid, but she was over eight months pregnant and she couldn't be sure of Robbie's exact arrival. And in those days, it wasn't seemly to have a, such a pregnant bridesmaid. As it happened, he was a little bit late, and I remember the excited phone call I got in Saskatoon telling me the news. Elaine's mother-in-law felt it important for Rob to have godparents. I was to be the godmother, although Elaine and I weren't entirely sure what my duties were. Whatever they should have been, I do know I failed miserably. <laughs> I just hope the lack of attention hasn't scared Rob for life. <laughs> when Heather was born, what an honor when they chose to name her Heather Lenore. The years passed and Elaine stayed in Regina, then Larange, and finally Deep Cove and Vancouver. I lived in London, England, Montreal, and Ottawa. Again, she wrote long letters and we kept in touch. Whenever, whenever I was back in Regina, we had a place to stay, and when my mother was in the hospital and I was home with two little children, I couldn't have managed without Heather's babysitting and Elaine's support. And Heather even came to Ottawa with my Aunt Lynette for more babysitting duties when I went with John to a meeting in Amsterdam. The Wood family managed two visits to see us. I have a guest book and see that on August 2nd of 1967, the family, minus Karen, stayed with us in Montreal during Expo 67. And 10 years later, on July 10th, 1977, everyone was here in Ottawa. Looking at her entry in the guest book, I see Elaine visited October 8th, 14th, 1992. She had such beautiful handwriting. The last time we were in Regina together was in 2010 at the Central Collegiate Reunion. Blair kindly lent us his house and a car while they were away in Los Casio. John was our driver and we attended events at the Hotel Saskatchewan and a grand finale at the Rough Rider game. Elaine, and I, Elaine insisted I buy a Rider jersey, which came in handy when my cousin Hugh died and we went to the funeral in Francis where the dress code was Rider things. A whole three days together of many memories. We managed a couple visits to Deep Cove, but mostly we kept in touch with phone calls. We never missed a birthday and emails. Often just short, silly things from a long time ago that would pop into our heads and we would have to share them. A couple of months after John died, I could travel again, and I knew that I wanted to see Elaine most. Luckily, I had a place to stay as my good friend Kay who had filled in as my bridesmaid when Elaine wasn't able, lives in Vancouver. I went to see Elaine and see the place she described where she lived. Although she wasn't well, we laughed and we talked and we had a wonderful visit. We managed another phone call after, and then she died a few weeks later. She has left a big void in my life and my heart. When I think of some of the things we would have, we did a long time ago, but I'm a bit vague on details, I think I'll leave with them over. Thanks, Lamar, for sharing all this with us. Thank you, Kim. Um, if you could just quickly indulge us, my daughter Parker has something that she would like to say. She wrote it down the other night. This is her baby from Great Anna. Can I open it up? Hi. To Great Nana, I wish you were here. I love you. I know you. I know you. 
you would love watching us run around and play. Um, Oda, would you? Come, Daddy. Come. Um, like Ori said, I was probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Oda, my oldest daughter, but I'm, like Ori said, probably all my grandchildren felt that way. Um, Arnetta was amazing. She always went the extra mile to make everyone, every uh, one of us grand grandchildren feel special. And that we live miles apart, us in Norway and her in Canada. Uh, and then I had a very strong, close relationship. Um, as in, she lived with us with the grandchildren. Henrik and I used to go to see Hannah and Anna about once a year. We talked on the phone regularly, often an hour or so, before Dad had to tap us out because of the long distance call. <laughs> um, she always kept so in tune with our lives. I remember as a teenager how she um, befriended the people at the very coolest clothing store in China, you know, by me and all some of the other grandchildren, the very best clothes for our birthdays. Um, and this, that's just one of the many memories exemplifying how Anna uh, made such an effort to be in tune and connected with our lives. Other core memories with Nana, well, there are way too many to mention all, but uh, celebrating the millennial year with Nana, Henrik, and Oslo, Nana running around the living room with streamers, <laughs> laughing her hands off. Um, the summer we spent alone in Regina, Jamie and I, I guess you see there's an album back there from that summer. Great memories. And the weekly dinners when I attended UBC in Vancouver. All of them testament to Nana and her ability to go that extra mile, uh, making the most of all our time together. Our Nana was amazing, and she will be truly missed. Thank you, Ove. Anyone else who would like to share? Yeah, come on. Uh, my name is Betsy Briarly. And um, I don't public speak very often, but I have a few notes here. <laughs> um, I think I didn't know Elaine well in Orange, um, which I find very interesting because that seems to be, that's where we met her, that's where, that was the basis of our relationship. And um, Larry knew Morley much better because they worked together in Orange, but um, I remember Elaine as an activist, and she was she was the one who had organized the casseroles for the sit-ins. <laughs> and there were, there was a big sit-in, and I know that I was on the list for a casserole. <laughs> um, I think the time I, I got to know Elaine much better was when she moved to Deep Cove, and I had to go down to Vancouver once a year because of medical issues, and she was also dealing with her own medical issues. So I would go visit her at least once a year, and she would introduce me to classy things. Elaine was my classy friend <laughs> in Vancouver. I had other friends in Vancouver, but they were not <laughs> and she, um, as somebody else mentioned, Mitch's restaurant, she introduced me there. And I always thought, <laughs> well, you can't go to Mitch's, it's too posh and it's expensive. But Elaine did it all. She went to all those places. Um, and later, when she moved to Olympic Village, that was fun too because she had her scooter and she. We'd go to those fancy restaurants on the walkway. And of course, yeah, she did know everybody. Um, I think the, a testament to how much respect people had for Elaine was her 50th birthday, which was in Regina. And that was about 19, 
87, does that sound right? 87. And um, people came from Ontario and BC. And it was February, and it was a giant. <laughs> I was just blown away. And it was fabulous, and I think her kids had a big, a big piece in that. Um, when she died, I sent an email to my daughter, Megan, who lives in Calgary. And Megan wrote back, um, when you talk to Elaine, she always made you feel that you were important. And I think that's what I'll remember about Elaine. And she raised four brilliant children, and they have raised brilliant children, and on and on and on. Thanks. She was a kindred spirit. Thank you. Kate now, would you like to come? grandchildren, which I think make us But yeah, we were just brainstorming last night about some of our, the things that we think about most when we think of Nana. And for us, um, it's when, after she moved to Vancouver in 2005. Um, while we always celebrated the big milestones with Nana, it was the little moments that we also look back on with particular fondness. Uh, we were fortunate to live a short walk away from her apartment in Yukon, and we would frequently make the short journey to the forest to visit with Nana. Uh, in fact, we took that uh, path through the forest so often, we eventually choreographed the walk, uh, navigating the roots on the ground with the same footsteps every time. Um, and when we made it to Nana's apartment, we were always greeted with a warm disposition, our favorite snacks, and the John sodas she stopped, stopped specifically for visitors, and the stories of her adventures since our last visit. We always had so much fun at Anna's, um, as many of you guys uh, probably agree. She made such an effort to engage with us, and whatever age that we were at. When we were younger, she had yo-yos and her collection of bears, and our particular favorite, a Charlie Brown video game on her laptop that we would play for hours and hours. <laughs> um, she just always knew what we would enjoy, regardless of how old we were. Um, in addition to playing together, as a lot of other people have mentioned, she was also very interested in who we are as people. Even when we were young, she always wanted to know who we were. Um, so she knew our current hobbies, our favorite school subjects, and what we were most looking forward to. Um, for me personally, Nana changed the direction of my life when she introduced me to the 10th anniversary concert of the Miserable. That sparked theater for me, and that's what I ended up going to school for and meeting my husband. So those moments where she got to know us you know, were life changing. Um, sorry. <laughs> and, um, Beyond that, um, Nan knew about our friends. She would always ask us how they were doing. It was a wider circle, like I'm sure many of you had as well. Our friends, in turn, knew about Nana, uh, especially on the one occasion that she baked my school birthday dessert and treated my classmates to her famous lemon tarts. Um, and when we went out with Nana, it always reinforced how special she was in the greater community. Um, Rob already mentioned the dollars in Starbucks, which she was already good at, but also um, dinners at arm's reach. Nana always knew people. Um, and yeah, I think it's clear Nana's capacity for kindness, curiosity, and genuine interest in others extended beyond just her family and friends, but to the greater world as well. Yeah, um, even as young children, we found Nana particularly easy to hold a conversation with. Um, I think that quality can be attributed to the passion uh, that she brought to her interests. Um, and I always found this manifested in her love of sports. Um, we found her call speaking with Nana about her favorite athletes, uh, including Roger Federer, Henrik and Sedin, and just about any Canadian tennis player who were playing all the time. Um, at the same time, she was not afraid to talk about things she disliked, and she was always uh, willing to share it with you. 
uh, as anyone who knows about the Boston Bruins or Patrick Kane uh, would know. Um, and we were lucky to have someone so full of life uh, with a willingness to speak their mind. Their, their life. Yeah. So much like my cousin said, it's impossible to sum up our relationship with who we think is the world's best man. Yeah. Um, we're going to miss her for so many reasons, but we find ourselves missing the most just when we want to drop our text or drop in to talk about the latest Canuck score, um, a beautiful garden that we pass, or just kind of chat about our days. So we were so grateful to have so many beautiful memories of Anna and have it with us in Vancouver. Hi there, um, my name is Doug MacArthur. Uh, I wanted to just first of all say uh, how much I appreciated hearing all of the stories and the overviews on her life and all of the multiple dimensions in, in Elaine's life. Obviously, uh, she just had so many things that she was involved in, so many things she was committed to, uh, and so much energy for such a, a, a very variety of things. And to all of those things, she obviously brought a huge amount of commitment. And I just wanted to say a brief word about her involvement, her contribution, and her commitment in politics. Uh, she worked for me as I was a minister, a minister in the BC, in the Saskatchewan government here for a time. And she worked as an assistant in my office, worked for me as an assistant. Uh, and I was just always so interested in what Elaine did and what she had to say when it came to politics. She was. Uh, she's been mentioned, she was a feminist. She was, in many respects, a radical. Uh, she was interested in ideas. And when Elaine was in the room, uh, you talked about issues that we had to deal with uh, from multiple perspectives. And it was not just how it would appear or how it would work in government when you were talking about policy. Uh, it was how it would involve and affect people. She always seemed to have an understanding or a feel for uh, let's say ordinary people or people who were in the community who she understood and she was willing to come forward and, and, and speak to with respect, from that perspective. And it was always very helpful and impressive and interesting that she had such a, a wide, ra wide range of understanding uh, of, of, of people and about people's concerns and interests. Uh, I really uh, found Elaine so interesting. Um, one of the things I found, she was, you know, she was fierce. Uh, she was a fierce person. She really, when she, when we would talk about some issues or reviewing something or dealing with some particular uh, aspect of our political lives and our political work, uh, she would, uh, she would say something would come up and she'd say, um, "This, that's bad. That's not good. This is, uh, no, this is really bad." And and then and then she would always introduce somewhere along the line some. Something that brought forward her little laugh, her, her, her sense of humor. And she had a way of being able to combine that serious uh, commitment to dealing with political issues and dealing with the problems in people's lives. At the same time, always having this sort of human dimension, this laugh, this little joke, there's something uh, about what we were talking about. It, it made uh, it made Elaine a very interesting person to, to have as part of a group that were uh, working on political issues and political life because she brought a multiple number of dimensions to what we were doing. She worked at the community level. She worked in the, over in the legislative buildings. She worked in the constituency offices. There's a number of people who have been referenced to she worked with in political life. Uh, so I just wanted to say, I, I kind of, how much I appreciate, uh, appreciated what Elaine contributed, what she brought to, to politics in, in BC, in, sorry, in, uh, not in BC, in Saskatchewan and uh, in the North. Uh, but in various aspects of, of political life in the province. So uh, I just want to say thank you, Elaine, and uh, just note that she did make a very, very important contribution to political life in this province. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to share? Come on up.
Thank you, Doug, for those wonderful words about Elaine. Thank you. My name is Louise Samard, and Elaine also worked for me at a point in time. And uh, we developed a very strong relationship that carried on over the telephone. Um, my making trips to Vancouver to visit her on, on a regular basis for a period of time. Towards the end, that didn't happen as much, but for a number of years it did. I found Elaine to be a very strong woman. She was very supportive, very wise, and very loyal. She was, I know she was extremely loyal to Doug because she talked to me about that many times. She had so much respect for you, Doug. And of course, she loved her family. And the comments that have been made about how much she loved her family were so true. Because she always was telling me whenever I met with her, how pleased she was with members of her family. She enjoyed life and had a great perspective on life and family and a great perspective on politics. Doug is right, she was a political warrior and she was fierce. And I can remember shortly after the 2016 election in the US, she phoned me up and said, Luis, that man's dangerous. <laughs> of course I agreed with her. <laughs> so um, she was a great friend and a confidant and I know I will miss her and many here in this room well as well. But I want to thank her family for, for all their support, for sharing her and uh, just let you know that you're in my thoughts today and uh, Elaine remains in my thoughts forever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to share? Okay, well, we will start to wrap up. Um, as another one of the grandkids, I just have one quick um, story and then we will be on our way. I have endless memories of going to Nana's house. As you've heard from all of us, always stop to the room with our favorite foods and drinks. My personal favorite was Velveeta cheese. She would have some activity for us to do, whether it was a craft, a new computer game, picking raspberries from her garden, exploring the junk room. We would play in our playhouse, create memories of Russ the Bear, do marble mazes, or look through photos. It was always fun and always something to look forward to. When I moved to Vancouver in 2016, I started having weekly Sunday night dates with Nana as we would cook supper and dessert together. And get this, I would watch the newest episode of Game of Thrones with her. At this point, she was a spry 79 years young and she lovingly sat through the gore and multitude of inappropriate scenes so that we could hang out and avoid me having to buy an HBO Go Pass. <laughs> I have such fond memories of those nights, which we ended with a new episode of Veep and hearing Nana hoarse with laughter at whatever newest antic Julia Louis Dreyfus's Veep had gotten herself into. My whole life, as you've heard so much today, I've been touched at Nana's ability to connect with each of us individually, to make each of her grandchildren and their partners feel valued and special and worthy. You could feel the love she had for you, and she always brought us together. I knew I was lucky and what an incredible character she was, but then I had my first baby, Parker. Seeing the love that she had for us ripples so deeply into her great-grandchildren, at that point just Marie and Parker, but now into her ten great-grandchildren, was quite a sight to behold. My own children, Parker, Emerson, and Kingston, even in their young little lives, have such deep and meaningful memories of their great Nana. She would text, write, and explore their ever-evolving interests uh, to make sure she always had something they were interested in to play with, watch, or talk about when we were able to get together. And she showered them with love and thoughtful and generous gifts. I have a final letter that she wrote to Parker, Emerson, Kelsey, and Kingston in early summer last year. Great Nana wishes you many happy years of playing in your playhouse at Nana and Grandpa's yard. Your great, great, great granddad, Alex Hunter, built mine. One time, my mom gave me five cents, a nickel, and when the bread delivery man came, I gave him the money for a bun. He knocked on my playhouse door. The playhouse was used as a clubhouse too when my friends and I were older. How lucky are we to have playhouses? Very lucky, I think. I love, 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 love you all so much. Kisses and hugs all around. Great Anna. 
It strikes me as one of the many great things that she passes on to us as she took the time to share the past with my children, to speak to them with love and storytelling. She is a constant name in our house and will be a permanent fixture in our hearts. I hope we continue to be unified together even without her consistent check-in and update on the family news. She was the true matriarch of our family and I miss her every day. I hope she's somewhere goading a Blackhawks player and cheering us all on. So thank you to everyone for sharing with us today and for joining us as we celebrate Elaine, the amazing woman who we all love and miss so dearly. There's such a through line in all that we've heard today about the joy, welcome, humor, connection, and love that Elaine shared with us all. Truly a life well lived and a legacy of love and unity left in her wake. I'm so grateful to be a product of her life and will continue to remember Elaine for all that she was to all of us. Before we finish with another musical performance, I'd like to publicly thank Kim, Jackie, and Heather, as well as the rest of Elaine's family members for all of their time and effort in planning today's ceremony. Such love and thoughtfulness was put into all aspects of today, from the choices of music to the butter tarts we'll be enjoying in just a few minutes. And I feel so grateful to have had this time with all of you remembering the incredible woman that my Nana was and the indelible mark she's left on each of us. Her legacy will live on through us as we continue to share stories and memories and carry her with us. I would now like to invite Shannon and Adam back up to close out the formal portion of our afternoon with a performance of Amazing Grace. Please feel free to sing along. Following their performance, we invite you to join us for some food and drink and time together in the foyer. Adam and Shannon, the floor is yours.
please feel free to make yourself <laughs> 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 or sit and relax with the slideshow guy. <laughs>